I invite you to the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, and we're going to be looking primarily this morning at two verses, verses 12 and 13, as we unpack the topic of killing sin, killing sin. Romans chapter 8, I'm actually going to begin our reading in verse 9, and we'll read through verse 13, but our main focus will be there in those two verses. Hear God's Word. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you die, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on the reading of His Word. Father, we thank You that You are not a God who is distant. You are not a God who seeks to hide in the shadows, to to remain hidden from Your creatures. You have made Yourself known in this world through Your creation. You have made Yourself known through Your prophets and apostles And you have made yourself crystal clear through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, this morning we benefit greatly from your revelation. You have revealed yourself to us. We have come to trust in you. We trust in your word. And Father, we desire that you would teach us how to follow you as your children in this world that is under the sway and influence of those forces which are opposed to you, which seek to do us harm, to ensnare us, to trip us up. Father, we pray that we would be equipped for the battle with knowledge of how the battle works, how it is that we as your people conquer sin, and pursue and cultivate holiness, purity in our lives. Father, Lord, may your Spirit use your Word to teach us this and to strengthen our resolve to be killing sin, that sin would not be killing us. Bless this time for our good for your praise. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we know from our own experience and from the Scripture, we as Christians, even though we have come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, even though the Spirit of God still dwells dwells within us, we still struggle with sin. Sin still remains a part of our life. As we've seen so far in the book of Romans, just because that sin remains does not call into question the assurance that we are children of God. We saw that in the very first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that includes even uh, every one of us where sin still remains. There is no condemnation despite remaining sin. But as we've seen already in the past verses as well, God has put His Spirit in us. We read that earlier in verses 9 and 10, that the Spirit dwells in us and His dwelling in us is evidence that we belong to God. But the Spirit belonging in us and dwelling in us not only means that we belong to God, but it brings with it a blessing. A blessing. 
The blessing of life, both the spiritual life that we now enjoy, the Spirit is life because of righteousness, Paul said. But it also is going to bring life to our mortal bodies. One day it will bring about a resurrection from the dead. From this corrupted mortal body, we will receive a body that is beyond corruption, beyond sickness, beyond death. That's the blessing that the Spirit brings when He dwells within us. But we also saw that it brings an obligation. The Spirit dwelling in us means that we are debtors. Some of the translations you may have says we are under obligation, verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, according to sinful ways. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That's what the mind that is set on the flesh does. It leads to death. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We have an obligation because the Spirit dwells in us to live not according to the flesh, but to live according to the Spirit. As verse 14 says, we'll look at next week or two weeks, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And those who live according to the flesh are not. That's the instruction. So we have this This instruction here of recognizing because we possess the Spirit, we have an obligation to live a certain way. And it's very important to see how Paul's done this. Before he gives instruction on how we ought to live, how we ought to change our behavior, and he gets to that instruction, he has laid a very solid foundation that we are are not condemned, we are sons and daughters of God. God has put to death the, the, the flesh... Through His Son, Jesus Christ, He's accomplished all that apart from us. But because He has accomplished that, because He has removed condemnation from us through the condemning His Son in the flesh, and He has deposited His Spirit within us, now there is an obligation that we change. It's not change in order to have condemnation removed. God's already done that through the blessing of His Son. But now that that is done, Paul does move to this instruction that we have to put to death the deeds of the flesh, or as I shorten it, we have to kill sin. We have to pursue holiness. Now when we think about this responsibility that every Christian is called to become holy by the Spirit through the process of killing sin. Every Christian is called to that. Every Christian is called to the process of becoming holy by the work of the Spirit, by putting to death the deeds of the flesh, by killing sin. And when we think about this and we explore this in a little more detail, what I want to do is start by showing the wrong instruction that we often hear, even from, I think, people who mean well, Uh, and who, generally speaking, get a lot of other things in the Christian faith right. But when it comes to a big word here, the word sanctification, which simply means the process by which God's people become pure or become holy in this life, people sort of lose their mind. And there's all kinds of teachings out there that have created a lot of confusion and tripped people up when it comes to how is it that we as God's people stop sinning and we pursue holiness. And so we're going to look at that. As I've said, the process is every Christian's called to, and they are called to by the Spirit to kill sin. That's that's the process. It's an active process. Two key words there. There are two pitfalls, two major pitfalls, that we must avoid when we think about killing sin. And the first of that is, is what often is referred to as perfectionism. And this teaching comes in a lot of forms, but at its heart, it's saying that that you can have an experience as a Christian whereby sin is totally eradicated from your life. And you can see why this is appealing. This This is what we look for as human beings, right? When we think about dieting, we want some kind of peel. We want some kind of magic formula that's just going to zap it away. Instead of hearing, right, the, the, the discipline regimen of the way to lose weight is don't you need to burn more calories than you consume. There's no magic formula. 
to weight loss. There's just a lot of people who know that you want a magic formula, and so they market things to make money off of you. And that same process is brought into the church. People know that, 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 that people are hungering for a magic formula. And, and, and there's just this one mountaintop experience. If you, if you could just have been there with me when I had that experience and how sin was totally eradicated, and if you want to know those secrets, then you can buy my book on the way out. Or buy my CD. This is, it's a marketing tool. Now, did they have that mountaintop experience? It's questionable. If they have a million dollar house, probably not. They're, uh, they're a con man. And they're peddling God's word for money. And what this is teaching is always, comes in a lot of different forms. Some people will talk about, you need to be baptized with the Spirit. If you're just baptized with the Spirit in this monumental experience of the Spirit, sin will be totally defeated you'll experience vic total victory. And so people spend time and year after year seeking some mountaintop experience that's going to give them ultimate deliverance from sin. When the Bible's saying that's not how it works. Now, there might be special moves of the Spirit. I don't deny that. But the Bible never teaches that's how you're going to eradicate sin totally from your life. And rather, it teaches that sin is eradicated through a process by which Christians have been armed by the power of the Spirit and day after day, in a ho-hum fashion, they put to death sin. They oppose it by the power of the Spirit. No magical formula, no mountaintop experience, just the ordinary work of the Spirit in the here and now. So we, we avoid this sort of total eradication of sin in some monumental experience, mountaintop experience. Now, I won't deny that that can never happen, but we're never taught in Scripture that that is something we ought to seek or that's how God works. We just hear that from experiences that people have. And it's always dangerous to build your view of the Christian life off someone's experience and not the Word of God. The second pitfall we want to avoid is that uh, which is often used in, a, in the terms of abiding in Christ. Now, the term abiding in Christ is a biblical term. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. So we're not against abiding in Christ. What we're against is this idea that abiding in Christ is a passive venture. Oftentimes you will hear this put like this. Well, you know, you're just... You're just you're weighted under a ton of depression and, and, and bad emotions from your childhood and, and you're just seeing everything falter around you, nothing's going well, and you're, you're at your wit's end, you're just frazzled and you're just totally out of control. And what you need to do is you just need to let go and let God handle it. That's how they do it. Typically, it'll come in that form. They're a lot better at it than I am. Or in some beautiful Instagram photo. They know how to market this stuff. But the reality is, if you let go, God's not going to grab. You're going you're to face plant right on the floor. Because God doesn't tell us to let go. God doesn't call us to surrender. Nowhere in the Scripture. But an entire understanding of how we progress as Christians has been built on this type of teaching. We don't view that the, if you sort of find this secret right way of abiding with Jesus, then you don't have to do anything. That Jesus will win the victory for you in your fight against sin and temptation. This non-action is not something that's taught in Scripture. So what does it actually mean when we think about Becoming holy, we recognize that it is a process by which we are called to action after God has empowered us to take that action. I believe that's what Paul's here when he's saying, if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit, so it's not pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps, right? We're receiving a power from God. If by the Spirit, you, not Christ, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So it's a process, a, if you, the present tense, an ongoing battle, a fight 
not a surrenderment, but a battle, a fight, a call to arms of attacking and opposing sin. We do that by the power of the Spirit. Both of those things have to be present. Not a magical mountaintop experience that totally eradicates sin all forever from our life, and not some magical abiding in Christ where we're sort of passive and Christ does the work. Neither of those are presented to us in the Scripture. And I understand that a lot of this can be very embedded in our thinking. I was raised sort of in an environment uh, where we taught these types of things and just recognized the futility of it. I face-planted many times. I grew very frustrated that I was just missing out on that magical moment, that magical abiding in Christ, thinking it was up ultimately to God. I was just going to hand it all over to Him or acknowledge that I was helpless and hopeless to do with anything with sin, that Christ would have to ride in and save the day. And I want to show you that what, and and I think the best way to do this is just to get a, a broad overview. I don't normally do this in my sermons, but what I want to do is just look at a number of passages, those by the Apostle Paul and by the other apostles that show that this, that, that those types of pitfalls have to be avoided in place of it adopting a process by which we as God's people, empowered by the Spirit, are actively putting to death sin. I want to start here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to turn to a number of passages this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 13. Notice the call to action here. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for the mood, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised, and God raised the Lord and will raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that one who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Now notice this next phrase in verse 18. Just let go and let God take care of sexual immorality. That's not what it says. Flee. Flee from sexual immorality. Then he goes on in another passage, there in chapter 9, verse 24 of this same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do not receive a perishable wreath. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now just think how much frustration the Apostle Paul experienced because he just didn't let go and let God handle it. No, he's saying I'm running with purpose. I'm boxing the air. I'm disciplining my body. Now he's all doing that because the Spirit of God dwells in him. But he's running, he's boxing, he's disciplining, he's training himself, he's using the imagery of an athlete. Now think about if someone were to go up to someone training to run in a marathon in the Olympics, and they say, you know, I'm hoping to win the gold in the the marathon here in the Olympics, but my training regimen is just sort of let go and do what I want to do. Somebody else will train for me. That's not the case. The empowerment of the Spirit does not remove our responsibility to be active in this battle against sin. In the 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, Paul says, since we have these promises, since we have what kind of promises? Well, back in Romans 8, we've seen there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God dwells in us. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, you have access to. Since we have these promises, let go and let God? No. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So who's bringing holiness to completion? We're not letting go and let God do it. We have promises and power from God, and we are called to do that. You have to see that. Again, another example, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in, 
in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. There's an earnestness, there's an urging to walk, to live according to the manner of which we've been called. That is according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. Then in verse 17, he gets into a little more detail of what this is, of chapter 4 of Ephesians. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Again, Paul's saying, put off the old ways and put on the new. And he can tell that because he knows these individuals have the Spirit of God. Again, another example, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through 13. Probably one of the more familiar passages here. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now... Not only as in my present, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, how can he call upon us as Christians to work out our own salvation? Verse 13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Again, empowerment of the Spirit, but that doesn't remove a responsibility for us to work out our salvation. The Spirit's presence makes that work us willing to do it, and it makes that work possible. Another example uh, that from as as Dave's been preaching through Colossians, we're not going to read it, but Colossians chapter three verses one through ten is an entire instruction on the responsibility that a Christian has to pursue holiness. First Thessalonians chapter four. Verse 1 through 5, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Abstain. Each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. That doesn't sound like letting God control it. That sounds like Paul is expecting these Christians in Thessalonica to, that they've been empowered to do so because they know God unlike the Gentiles, unlike the pagans. 1 Timothy chapter 6, here Paul writing to a young pastor by the name of Timothy tells, gives this instruction at the end of his letter. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 11, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from approach until the appealing appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, look at that language. Pursue, fight, take hold. These are not passive, sort of letting go and abide and letting Christ take the wheel, right? That's not, that's a good country song, but that's not a biblical teaching about how we pursue holiness. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. But God's firm foundation stands bearing the seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. We can go on and on. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 12. 
verse 1 through 4. Listen to this exhortation from the writer of Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And then here's the phrase, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith. And here's what happens. Here's where people go wrong. What people do is they look at this passage and immediately there's one of those verses that you're more attracted to. You're bent towards either verse 2, looking to Jesus, and that's what a lot of times people will teach. The way you become holy is you just got to look to Jesus. You just got to remember who you are in Christ. You just got to reflect on what Jesus did on the cross. Well, that's true, but that's not all. You have to also lay aside every weight and sin that clings to you. You have to also run the race with endurance. You just get the power to do that by looking at Christ, not from your own self. And so the tendency is through different groups and people, they pick one of those verses. They are either sort of killing sin and and denying worldliness and all these things, and they ignore looking to Christ, or they talk about looking to Christ and they don't really focus on the exhortation to run the race with endurance, or lay aside every weight that ensnares them. You have to have both if you're going to be biblically balanced. You can go to James chapter 1, or you can, particularly I want to read from James chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. Again, I'm just trying to help you see that this isn't just some one-off thing in the Scripture. It's a very deep ingrained thing. James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. Again, exhortations for action for God's people. First Peter is filled with numerous examples of this. You can write these down and look at them later. First Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. First Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. I'll read 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Right? There's an obligation, a debt. Peter's using the same idea that Paul used back in Romans 8. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So Paul's, Peter's point here is, look, you have to arm yourself against this. You've spent enough time before you knew Christ doing these types of things. Now the time is to live in a different way. And then there in chapter 5 of the same book, verses 8 and 9, Paul says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the whole world. And then lastly here in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, we sort of come to a conclusion on this journey here. Paul writes, or excuse me, the Apostle John writes, and by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, I'm a Christian, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in Him. Whoever says He abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which He walked. So again, we don't shy away from the imagery of abiding in Christ. We shy away from a teaching that abiding in Christ is a passive thing. Rather, abiding in Him, if you say you're doing that, you will walk as He walked. Then in chapter 3 of the same book, verse 3, And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. So hopefully you see that the, the weight of Scripture here, there is absolute agreement among the apostles in the early church that we as Christians are called to become holy. 
by killing sin by the power of the Spirit. That's how we make advancement in the Christian life. Not by pursuing some momentous mountaintop spiritual experience whereby sin is magically eradicated from our life. Nope. There's no microwave version of sanctification. And we also don't view our overcoming sin as something that we sort of surrender to God and sort of come before Him and say, Lord, I'm hopeless and helpless. I can't do anything about this. You're just going to have to take the wheel. You're just going to have to take control. It, it, it really pushes my buttons. There's another way I wanted to say that, but it pushes my buttons. When, we, when I hear people say to Christians, you are hopeless and helpless, it, it's just not true. If we are hopeless and helpless, then why in the New Testament, When the apostles write these letters, they always begin the letters talking about the promises of God, who we are in Christ. We have all these benefits and blessings of salvation. And then at about middle way through the letter, they switch gears and they start giving exhortation. Now why in the world, if God was just going to take control and do it all, why would you give exhortation and instruction to Christians to do something? To resist the devil, to submit to God to purge yourself of this, to avoid that, to put on that and put off this. Why are you doing that, Paul? Don't you understand I'm helpless and I'm hopeless? It might be because Paul doesn't think we're helpless and hopeless. It might be that Paul believes that the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in us. And therefore, we are not helpless and hopeless in the face of sin. We have been equipped with everything we need to live a divine and holy life. That just might be what's in Paul's mind. This type of teaching, a passive approach, is inconsistent with how the apostles themselves instructed. Right? You should come to the end of Ephesians chapter 4 and instead of talking about walk in the manner worthy, just say, you know what, guys, I recognize you're hopeless and helpless. God will take care of it. Just surrender it to Him. Turn it over to Him. Let Him take the wheel and take control. But that view is inconsistent with the testimony of Scripture. It's, it's inconsistent with how the New Testament itself is written. Right? And then... It's inconsistent with the teaching of the New Testament on how we ought to view ourselves as Christians. This idea of being hopeless and helpless. Just in the book of Romans, I want to show you this. Because I think this is one of the reasons we, we, we see very little progress in killing sin. Because if you don't think you ought to be doing anything, you shouldn't be surprised that nothing's happened. God didn't, God didn't tell you to let go and let him take control. He gave you the Spirit to empower you against it. But listen listen to these instructions about who we are as Christians. In Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching for which you have been committed. So we're, we're, we're no longer slaves of sin. And in Romans chapter 6, there's a constant focus, and in chapter 5, that we are in Christ. Over and over, Paul makes that statement. We are in Christ Jesus. Verse 11 of chapter 6, he says this, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, and get this, alive. So are we hopeless and helpless? Well, we're no longer in the flesh. We're in Christ Jesus. We're no longer dead in sin, but we're alive to God. In verse chapter 5, verse 20 through 21, Paul says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, that's how we used to be, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life. So where once sin reigned and death reigned, now grace reigns in our lives. In Romans chapter 8, verse 2, we learned that there is a new principle of life. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And then in verse 9 of Romans chapter 8, you, however, are not in the flesh, 
but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. Helpless? Hopeless? What about no longer enslaved to sin? What about alive to God? What about God's Spirit dwells in us? What about being under the reign of grace? What about having this new principle of life operating in our nature? The Scripture says we have become partakers of the divine nature. That doesn't sound helpless and hopeless. Now again, apart from God, we are that. But we're not apart from Him. He resides within us. And therefore, when you say, I'm going to let go and let God take control, He's given you control. A lot of Christians are like, you remember back in the Indiana Jones movie where he's been fighting all these people and he comes out and there's this big, tall Arabian guy and he's got this sword and he's showing off his skills and he's just like, oh man, how am I going to deal with this guy? And he just peels out a pistol and shoots the guy. And a lot of times, that's how we do in our Christian life. We're like Indiana Jones, and we see this guy and he's doing a sword, and we're like, oh, man, how am I going to fight him? And we go in there, and we try to do hand-to-hand combat with him. When God's given us a bazooka to deal with sin, because we don't recognize what we've been given. And then we're misled by these, I think many of them, well-intentioned preachers that are trying to tell us, there's a magical experience. There's this, no! The Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. What more do you need? So let's look at this in a practical means. What does it look like, the process of putting it in? First of all, you have to realize who you are. If you walk around thinking you're helpless and hopeless, you're going to be run over by every sin you face. Because you're, you're in a battle and you don't know, you don't realize that you're in a battle, you're not in a hospital. You realize who you are, and then we have to get on becoming holy. We have to get our hands dirty, we have to get in the fight, and know this is a fight we can win every time. Because we have access to a supernatural power. We get this in the verse, here we go. Romans chapter 8, verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And here's the process. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Two two words there, body. He's referring to our physical body and how it is a a seat of sin and corruption. The body itself is is, is the, the, the means or the instrument that sin uses to get us off track. God originally created the body perfect, without impurity, but it's the weakness. That's why it has to die. And that's where sin comes in. And so Paul's saying we're battling the deeds of the body. That's where sin's going to come in. And while eventually God will give us a new body for here and now, that's, that's where the problem resides. And then he says, if by the Spirit you will put to death the deeds of the body through the Spirit. And so we have to attack, we have to be aggressive in killing the sin that sort of finds its seat in our fleshly bodies. The Spirit's life because of righteousness, but the body is still corrupt, it's still decaying in sin, as Paul's already argued. So how is it that we put to death this sin? Where there, again, as always, there's always these false ways. Right? We, we, we've seen throughout the history of the church, there's one false way is through monasticism. If you'll just remove yourself from the world and the flesh and the devil and all those things, and you'll just go off somewhere in some spiritual retreat, some monastery, some desert place where there's no one, if you'll just get away from all that external stuff, then you can find holiness. And time and time again, throughout the history of the church, people have tried that and it has failed. One of the early church fathers, Jerome, who is responsible for the Latin Vulgate, his translation of that, of the Bible, Tried to do that for many years. He goes out into the desert. He's trying to especially remove himself from erotic fantasies. And he goes out in the desert. He's not seen anybody for a long time. And he still has these erotic fantasies. And he recognizes that it's foolish to think the way that you put to death the deeds of the flesh is to remove yourself from all that. Because the problem is still within. 
There's also the opposite side of this monasticism, and somewhat of a cousin of it, I should say, is this idea of a system of living or a code of ethics. And if you'll just adopt this, and you create these rules, and you buy into these rules, you can, you can squash out sin. This is what I think when people taught this abiding in Christ stuff, I think that's what they were reacting against. And they were right to react against this legalism of a code of ethics will deliver us, the idea that the law can do it. They were right in reacting to it. The problem was is they went too far. It's not the code of ethics that deliver us. It's the Spirit's power. But the Spirit empowers us to keep these rules, these laws that God has given for our human flourishment. That's why he's given them. So we want to avoid sort of this idea that removing ourselves to sort of a monastic view or this idea of adopting a code of rules will help deliver us. We recognize that it's by the Spirit, but the Spirit doesn't just come there so we can be spiritual couch potatoes. He's just going to take care of it. He's there to empower us, to equip us, to push us into fighting against Sin, to putting it to death. So those are the two things we want to avoid. So what are those positive things? We are called upon to use and to exercise the power that God has given us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk about this very quickly in conclusion in in two ways. There's the general way that the Spirit helps in this, and there are more particular ways. As I said earlier, we have to understand our position spiritually. This, is, I think, is the hardest thing for people to get because there's just so much false idea out there that exists that wants to let them off the hook. And quite frankly, it's just more attractive to believe that there's a magical experience out there or that God's just going to take control and do it for us. That's the It's it's attractive because it's easy. There's no responsibility put upon us. But that's not what the Scripture teaches. Now, coming into God's family, becoming a Christian is all of God. It's God's work. But now that we're His children, we've been equipped by His Spirit, He calls us to gird up our loins and move to action. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, Paul says, excuse me, Peter says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Oftentimes, I'll find myself, and maybe you can relate to this, praying, saying, Lord, I just need your help to do this. He's like, already given. Anything you want, you got it. Right? Sort of like the Roy Orbison of, 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 of the Christian faith here. He's just like, everything you need has been granted already. You can pray and ask for it, but what you really need to know is going, you have already have it. It's already been granted. The issue isn't access to power. You have it. We pertain, we have granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge. So how do we have access to through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. That's the access we have. That's your position spiritually. Everything you need. There's no sin you currently face you don't have power to. You have been my partakers of God's divine nature. That's it. So the issue then becomes the implementation of that power. We must understand that when we sin, the way we put to death is sin, recognize our position spiritually, recognize that when we sin, the the greatest problem is that we have grieved the Holy Spirit. Most of the time when we think about our sin, we think about it in relation to ourselves. I've failed. I've hurt other people. I've done this and that. And that's all true. But ultimately, we've grieved the Spirit of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Generally speaking, also, when we think about putting this power of the Spirit to killing sin, we must recognize the ultimate goal of doing this. The ultimate goal of avoiding falling now, but then also thinking about our future and the experience that we have In heaven, particularly here we see in in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. Paul writes, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. That's the here and now. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus 
Peter's saying, look towards the end goal. That helps us in the fight against sin. We kill sin because we await the day that we will enter in to Christ's eternal heavenly kingdom. That's our goal. We're sojourners and pilgrims on this earth. It's not our home. So direct our eyes to the ultimate goal of not falling in the here and now, but the rich entrance provided into His eternal kingdom. So we are called not to let go and let God. We are not called to seek after some magical mountaintop spiritual experience. We are called to exercise the power of the Holy Spirit in putting to death sin. We do that by understanding our position spiritually, by understanding that when we sin, we have grieved the Holy Spirit. And understanding that our ultimate goal is to avoid falling in the here and now and waiting and longing for that rich entrance into God's everlasting kingdom. Now more particularly, more directly here, when we think about fighting sin, what does that instruction mean to put to death sin? One of the words that's used is to abstain from sin. Again, there's no magic formula here. It's just abstain from sin. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Notice the instruction he gives. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. That's the way it works. Abstain from the passions of the flesh because those passions are waging war to destroy you. That's what's happening. You abstain from sin. You avoid it. You discipline your body. We saw back in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul said that. I discipline myself that I might not be disqualified. It takes effort. It takes work. Now, it's by the Spirit, but it's work. Luke chapter 21, verse 24, I think Jesus gives a little bit of insight into this and what that looks like when he gives this instruction, talking about waiting for the return of Christ. He says in, in Luke chapter 21, verse 34, He says, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. Watch yourself, guard yourself, discipline yourself. Romans chapter 13, 14, here in this great epistle of grace, when Paul gets towards the end of this book, he gives much exhortation in regards to these things. In chapter 13, verse 14, he says but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Abstain from this. Discipline your body. Make no provision for the flesh. Don't expose yourself to things that are going to cause you to trip you up. When temptation hits, James chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, we have to nip it in the bud. We can't entertain those thoughts. If we continue to entertain temptation, let our minds go down that road, we are entering into sin. We have to fight the enemy when it first arises. Listen listen to the instruction that, that James gives here in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, that is, before it's nipped in the bud, if we allow conception to occur, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings with it death. And when we do sin, when we fail to put to death, but we entertain and allow that sin to be conceived, we ought to not sort of move on in a hurry from our sin. We have to find a balance here. We can't wallow in condemnation and think we're condemned by God. We're, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But there's also a way that you can abuse that verse and become flippant. You can experience not a godly sorrow that leads to repentance, but a worldly sorrow. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. That's, the, the, that's sort of the direct and negative things. Abstain from this, discipline your body, nip it in the bud, have a godly sorrow when we sin. But we also notice some positive things that the Apostle Paul states here. I want to read just a few as we close up. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Paul says, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. 
And one of my favorite passages there, probably familiar to you as well, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's the positive, right? The other is abstain from sin. Here Paul's saying, if you walk by the Spirit, you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, we read earlier. But I want to conclude with this passage in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 10, because in this instruction on killing sin, it's very easy for us to become discouraged and negative because we're focusing on the sins that we're not seeing total victory over. And we can get a skewed view of ourselves because we, we see the work that is left undone and it can discourage us. And so we have to, in one sense, remain positive in this battle of killing sin, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 10, you know what Paul says about, or excuse me, Peter says about us? Us, where sin still remains, where there's temptation and sin that takes place, he says, You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people of his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's when He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Be killing sin. Why? Why? Because you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. God has deposited His Spirit in you so that you may proclaim the excellencies of who He is. And while there is remaining sin in our lives, yes, and we grieve it. We aim to fight it. But there are also areas of our life where the Spirit has worked magnificently. Areas which exclaim His praise and His worth and His value and His honor to a watching world. We must keep that in balance so that we do not become discouraged in our fight. He who would be friends with God cannot also be friends with sin. We must take up the responsibility that it is now ours, our obligation, because God has given us His Spirit. Join me in this great battle in waging against the deeds of Father, we thank you for the encouragement of your word. And Father, we thank you for the challenge of it. Lord, to know that there is a great calling, there is a, there is a responsibility, a submission to you, a resisting of sin, an abstaining from sin, a disciplining the body, of exercising our body in holiness and self-control, of purifying ourselves as he himself is pure. We hear these calls. Father, I pray that they would not land upon us as a burden, that we would not fight against sin as one who feels condemned. We're, there is no condemnation. We're in Christ. The Spirit is life in us. And now we have this awesome access to power. There's no greater power that you could give us than that which you raised your Son from the dead. And so, Father, let us not cower over in the corner. Let us not walk around groaning and moaning as though there's no hope and we're helpless and hopeless before the world, the flesh, and the devil. But let us view ourselves as we are, war warriors in an unstoppable army. Marching to Zion. We cannot be stopped. Though this sinful body will corrupt you, even in the in death, Lord, you get the victory. Father, help us to see this. Help us to know who we are. And with that courage and with that excitement, move to the battle. And begin to do battle with that sin which wages war against our soul. Father, give us endurance in this. This long journey, this battle that will go on until we leave this world. Help us not grow discouraged. Help us not to grow faint-hearted. Strengthen us. Remind us of who we are. In Christ's name we pray.